coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thang, athletes, and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host, Malt Jar. Now, for the past few years, IDW have been publishing their own Joe's Dread comics in the States. You may have previously heard our interview with Eric Freitas and Ulysses Farinas about their Joe's Dread Blessed Earth series. Well, this week, our guest is Mark Russell, who's the writer behind the new Joe's Dread series from IDW. If you haven't heard his name before, then you've missed out on some absolutely top flight comics. He's the author of God is Disappointed pointed in you from Top Shelf, which was a modern retelling of the Bible with cartoons by uh, Shannon Wheeler. Uh, he's also uh, the author of Prez and the Flintstones uh, for DC Comics. Now, the Flintstones is a very interesting take on the 1960s uh, cartoon where uh, Mark really used it to uh, reflect where things are at the moment in the world rather than just uh, pay homage to uh, a childhood memory. Really fascinating comics. He's also uh, the writer of uh, another cartoon uh, comic book series Snagglepuss which uh, yeah really challenging read really interesting and it's going to be fascinating to see what he does with Judge Dredd so it was great to uh, have a chat with him over Skype about his plans for Dredd and uh, what lurks inside Patrick Swayze block Mark, you 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 you, uh, you came to my attention certainly because of your work on uh, the Flintstones uh, for DC, and uh, also uh, your kind of your reboot of um, Snagglepuss from the Hanna Barbera uh, cartoons. Um, do, you, do you want to tell us a little bit about your your uh, career, how you've come to be uh, uh, writing on on titles like that? Yeah, I had um, written a book about the Bible uh, called God Is Disappointed in You. <laughs> which was sort of a, a modern retelling of the Bible, but very condensed. Every yeah. book of the Bible condensed down to like three or four pages each. And uh, somehow they got a hold of it at the DC offices. So when uh, an opportunity came up to write sort of a, a, a satirical comic book about a, a teenager who becomes president uh, called Prez, uh, they thought of me and they, they, they called me and asked me if I'd be interested in writing. It. And uh, when you get a call like that, it's, it's kind of hard to say no. So I, I agreed, and I wrote that series, and they liked it well enough that they offered me the point set. Because Prez was, um, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a series back in the 1970s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, 1973 to 1974. Mm. And it only ran for about four issues. Uh, so, uh, but, but yeah, it was cre- actually created by Joe Simon, who was the, the guy who created Captain America, of course. Mm strangely enough but it's a, it's about a teenager who becomes president at the time i think it was a, a lot of dealt with a lot of the sort of the hippie paranoia in the 70s about all these the the, the fear was back then i think that 18 year olds had just gotten the right to vote so that, that hippies they thought were just going to take over the country and <laughs> and turn turn it all into like you know altamont or something and it never really panned out that way, but that was kind of what the, the conceit of the original comic. And mine was more kind of like the opposite, like well, let's deal with a world where the hippies never took over, and <laughs> things have just gone from bad to worse. <laughs> well, famously, you know, one thing that hippies don't do is is uh, bother to vote. So uh, I, th- I think that fear was probably unfounded. Yeah, that was that was the great sort of thing they failed to foresee. It's like uh, no, the the hippies couldn't get it together enough to to capitalize on their numbers <laughs> so uh, with with something like the the, the flintstones i've read some really interesting uh, interviews online where um you talk very much about the the, the kind of uh, the existential questions that, that a series like the flintstones asks for most people th- those are quite big questions uh for the shoulders of uh, a kid's cartoon from uh, from way back when um why did you decide uh, to, to to bring these big issues to to, to something like that? Is, is it the the kind of contrast between expectations and, and and delivery? It was more just that that was what I wanted to talk about. Mm. I wasn't really in the Flintstones. I didn't really care about the Flintstones. I took it on as kind of a mercenary project. But I thought, well, what is it that I do care about? Uh, and really, it was about like uh, the you know civilization, the foundational errors, the, the institutions 
uh, that we've created that had how we've kind of outlived them or to the degree to which they're not serving us anymore. So I thought, well, you know, I, I'm not really interested in the Flintstones, but I'm really interested in, you know, the, the fact that it's the world's first civilization. Hmm. So I, I thought, well, I could use this as like a, as a prism to talk about my own thoughts on the world, which is kind of how I approach every title. And with something like the Flintstones, there was so much uh, of the original cartoon, which was a reflection of the time of that kind of um, the the suburbanite world of the the nineteen fifties and 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 sixties. You know, reflection of uh, what what I guess you call. The, in inverted commas, family values and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the pressures of, uh, 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 that went with that. Um, does that, uh, does that mean that, that, that things like that are always able to take that kind of, uh, thing that you're talking about? You know, you tell the story that you want to with this thing because it, it so easily reflects back what you put into it. Yeah. And I think that it's just a great premise mm. to me though. I- what I like about the Flintstones is, is the, the fact that it's, you know, it's, there's nothing else really like it in terms of, you know, a, 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 a domestic drama based on the Stone Age where they're figuring everything out for the first time, like television and electricity and, you know, division of labor. So I thought, well, that's just, a, it's just really ripe for a lot of commentary, it, you know, and, and, and cut them some slack because if you're going to figure, if you're figuring things out for the first time, like religion and, and uh commerce you're going to get a lot of things wrong you're going to make a lot of innocent mistakes uh our mistakes are are much less innocent because we've been at it for thousands of years uh but but i that's really what i wanted to be about like these people are kind of naive but they've they've got a right to be mm. do, do you think there's a, a metaphor there for for the kind of forgetfulness of modern society that um we we have forgotten so much of what has gone before us because it was so busy living in the now so busy uh, looking to the future uh, you know uh, what is new and fresh that perhaps we forget the foundations of what's gone before yeah absolutely i think especially that's kind of my my take on uh america in that you know we're a lot like bedrock and that we have this uh simplistic naivete that we imagine that that we're the first person first people to ever encounter these problems or the first people to ever um make these decisions not realizing that history is replete with you know horrible examples of other people who have tried these things and and uh, with, with with terrible results have you faced any um blowback from the, i can't believe i'm using this phrase flintstones fans uh, who were who expecting something in, in in a bit more of a traditional sense in in, in uh, you know kind of very homely essentially comedy comics <laughs> Uh, not a lot. Although I will say, I got more. Uh, I strangely, I got more people upset with me for messing with the Flintstones than I did for messing with the Bible. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure what that says about our priorities. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, there was a little at first, and I think a lot of people, most people, were just sort of groaning and rolling their eyes, like, "Oh yes, just what the world needs—a a gritty reboot of the Flintstones." You know, <laughs> and, and I can understand that. I, I probably would have felt the same way if I hadn't been the one writing it. Uh, but but I'm glad enough people gave it a chance uh, to be pleasantly surprised mm. by by what I was able to do with it. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the top, you know, it, it's very much for you about what story you want to tell with these characters. So so let let's move on to the thing that we're here to talk about, which is the the new Dread series uh, that you're doing with, with with IDW. What's the story that you want to tell with Judge Dread? <laughs> Well, in a lot of ways, Judge Dredd is kind of the natural endpoint of the Flintstones. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> this is a sentence I never thought I would hear. Yeah, right. It, it, but it's but it's completely intuitive. It's the consequence of all these poor decisions we've made about civilization coming to, to bear fruit. It's you know post nuclear apocalypse, this uh, heavily urbanized, industrial, uh, authoritarian nightmare state. And it really is kind of a dark mirror reflecting back to American civilization where it is heading if it continues on its current trajectory. So to me, that was, other than the fact that I've always just loved the character Judge Dredd, to me, that was just like too good of an opportunity to pass up. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I tell the story, which I think is kind of the story of, uh, of, um, of the United States right now, of like what happens when you neglect 
people for too long or what happens when you treat people like second class citizens and force them to live in the shadows they don't disappear they don't magically evaporate eventually they'll form their own institutions without you and um and and it will invariably come back to bite you in the ass what do you think are, 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 are some of, uh, uh, sorry to get a little bit political here, but what do you think are some of the, the, the mistakes that have been made that mean that uh, for you, Judge Dredd's world is uh, an extrapolation of, of uh, you know, the now, of, of you know, the, the, the issues that you're touching on in the Flintstones? Well, primarily, and just a little background on the, uh, the premise of the Judge Dredd series, uh, it takes place in this sort of urban uh, the, in this uh ma- this uh mega block called the patrick swayze block <laughs> and uh it it was designed originally to be sort of this model of affordable housing you know they were going to have like a factory inside there and you know a, a soy farm to bake to help make synthetic foods for the people who lived in patrick swayze and it's supposed to be like this sort of utopian project much like you know our own city inner city projects that were built in the 1930s they were, these were designed actually to be nice places to give poor people an affordable place to live but because the political will wasn't there to sustain it over time and the money went out of these places the, the promises of jobs and uh you know uh benefits that re- never really materialized these places just kind of turned into little purgatories and that's kind of what happens with the patrick swayze block in mega city one uh because the factory never shows up because the, the the farm never materializes the only asset these people have with which to make money is this waste tunnel that runs through the wall of mega city one out to cursed earth so they start having to ship in like sewage and uh toxic waste from from other uh city blocks and other sectors and so their, their building basically becomes a toxic waste dumping ground and ultimately uh, an invasion point for the mutants to get into Mega City 1 from Cursed Earth. So it's, it's very much kind of a metaphor for how we have allowed through urban decay and neglect of our own sort of marginalized populations created this, this, uh, this huge population of people who rightfully do not owe any loyalty to our country and, and or in fact creating... Uh, you know, this, are forced to create their own institutions that that um, that the, the nation will later have to reckon with. Because mm-hmm. satire has always been uh, a part of of Judge Dredd, though often it's kind of bubbled away uh, under the surface. How on the nose um, do you feel you have to be for a more American audience with with something like this? Yeah, uh, Winston Churchill once said something I've, I've, I've kind of taken to heart as a writer. He's like, you don't make a, a point with a feather, you make your point with a sledgehammer. <laughs> and yeah, that's something I, uh, I, I I believe in. I don't. I, I think that the substance is the best style, and it's better to like have like something that's really sort of true, expressed as bluntly and as uh, in condensed a fashion as possible. Uh, to me, that's like much more powerful than subtlety or you know uh, artistry. Mm. Uh, so I feel like it's not necessarily what I feel like Americans need. It's more this is the way I, I, I express myself because I feel like this is the way points need to be made. Because mm, mm. with uh, with a character like Dread, um, and we've talked about this ad nauseum on this podcast over the last three years, is about how so much of, of uh, his character is um, uh, the kind of opposite to the chaos around him so he is the fixed point around which the world turns you know he he he, he uh, so often he is the unchanging thing um right what's your take on this story with dread what part does he play is he a catalyst is he uh, an antagonist a protagonist you know uh, where, where does he sit within uh, within your within your comic i think he's an idealist he's somebody who has v- very uh specific vision of mega city one and how it's supposed to operate and how he believes it does operate and it's sort of uh eye-opening to him it's sort of uh when when he sees the way it actually does operate for these people that live within 
you know, in, in this forgotten corner of Mega City One. He, these are people that he normally would be arresting or, you know, uh, shoving into the ISO cubes. And, and now he's suddenly got to fight side by side with them against a uh, mutant invasion. And so, uh, Dread is forced to sort of like confront the fact that Mega City One is not the way he necessarily envisions it. Mm. Mm. One thing that, that's kind of come out in conversations I've had with with uh, previous um, uh, American creators who've worked on Dread, such as uh, Ulysses Farinas, uh, uh, um, uh, Eric Freitas, uh, and uh, Dwayne, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his surname, Jane, Dwayne Swazinski, Swazinski um, was a, a, about how uh, sometimes Dread can be a little bit too close to the bone in America, in Britain, it's a satire. You know, it's our satire of America, the way that we see America. But when you're actually in that culture, right, it can be a little bit too close to the bone. Um, particularly at a time when issues of law enforcement and the police's attitude towards uh, people of ethnic minorities uh, is really at the forefront. How do you stop it being too raw, too difficult? Well, I think in America, a lot of people view Dread differently than they do in Britain. As mm. you say, in Britain, he's viewed as a sort, the sort of like satire of America. But I think in America, there's a danger where if you if you make Dread too brutal, you make him too um, too violent. People see him as an aspirational figure. <laughs> <laughs> they see him as like, uh, yeah, they, they 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 cheer for that. And mm. so you have to be careful how you you know. You know I, I want people to take away the right sort of message from this which isn't that brutal violence is you know our uh, our only way out of this mess <laughs> uh I, I in fact tried to kind of like express the opposite so i had to kind of i, I didn't soften dread because dread ha- ultimately has to be dread but i i make him sort of the uh the david copperfield of the story where he's the observer of everything that's of his own life kind of you know, he, he sees what's he's sort of the catalyst for all the the, the craziness happening around him. I mean, what, what's what's your experience of Dread? You know, had, uh, how much uh, have have you read of of his uh, backstory and and you know, forty years of of, uh, of comics? Yeah, I, I haven't read it. Uh, I haven't read most of. It, but I read a, lo- uh, a bunch of um, obviously. Uh, Wagner's Dread and uh, Grant Morrison and Mark Millar's uh, Dread stories, and for me, kind of what same with the Flintstones. What always attracted to me, what always attracted me to the character, uh, is the the world building that goes into Mega City One. To me, Mega City One is really kind of the star. Uh, Dread is just kind of the natural consequence of building this uh, this civilizational sort of megalomaniacal. Mo- uh, monster, which is Mega City One. And I'm, I'm curious as to how you came to, uh, to 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 be working on on Dread Friday W because, like you say, you've 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 done stuff for uh, uh, for DC Comics with um, uh, Prez and uh, the Flintstones, and you're working on Snagglepuss. Uh, tell us a little bit about how it came to be. I had to sort of aggressively pitch it. Oh, um, really? Yeah, Dread is the first uh, comic that I actually actively went after, as opposed to having someone suggest to me or, or offer it to me. Uh, I really wanted to um, write a, a Dread comic precisely because I, I found Mega City One such a, an incredibly rich uh, viewing point of the future. And. I mean that, 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 that. I mean that's interesting to me because uh, certainly when, when we've spoken to IDW in the past, you know they, they've kind of pitched the kind of writers that they that they, they um, want to work on on uh, uh, on their dread comics. So it, it's very interesting that, that that you've kind of gone out of your way to uh, 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 to, to go for it. I mean, it took a long time to convince them too. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I pitched it probably over a year ago, and you know, a lot of email conversations and different ideas about what to do uh, with the story. So I really had to, had to kind of work to sell them on on letting me write a dread series. What what was what was the thing that finally tipped them over the edge? If there was something, I think it was the idea of him like having to sort of defend this poor city block against a mutant invasion. I had a lot of ideas. That was the one that they really seemed to like. Because they kind of imagined it as being this Fort Apache, the Bronx story, but I think that's a way to do, as as you said, sort of like 
satirize in America, uh, America in a way that doesn't make Americans feel too defensive about it. Mm. Because he is a good guy and he's defending uh, his territory from from an invasion. So I think that's the way he presents uh, uh, satire of Americans to themselves. Is you allow them to sort of you you, you get you, you find a way to get the message in without making them too defensive about it. Mm. Uh, you you allow them to like sort of take in the satire sideways as they still get to see themselves as the hero. <laughs> With uh, uh, the ancillary characters, without going into too much detail, not not giving too much away, um, what's going to be your take on the citizens themselves? Because so uh, uh, different writers have their own uh, aspects. You know, some some um, uh, writers portray uh, uh, the citizens as as kind of almost tragicomic uh, uh, characters uh, who, who <laughs> are essentially driven mad by the uh, uh, by the terrible world they live in. Others see them uh, m- uh, uh, much more kind of. Um, uh, I don't know how to describe this kind of units of. Um, not production, but of uh, interest. So, so each, each character, each citizen is this weird kind of individual, uh, all of their own. Others portray them as like this big mass of of uh, uh, barely concealed rage. Um, you're talking very much about uh, a populace in this block who are brutalized, who are uh, have been forgotten. Are we going to see characters that are uh, full of pathos or more tragic comic or, you know, how, how are you planning on bringing those citizens to life? I, I think that my portrayal is a little unique from what I've seen before in uh, Dread Comics in that I portray the citizens as kind of sadly heroic. Like they've been neglected. They've been forced to sort of come to their own defense and they're doing the best they can with the extremely limited resources that they have. Even the criminal gang that that Dread comes to the city block thinking is uh, to 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 arrest basically uh, end up being kind of heroic figures in the story. So it's it it's me. This is kind of the central conceit I think behind a, a lot of comics, which I think lends itself to sort of fascism and is the idea that people are just sort of either barbaric or helpless victims and that what's really needed are a few rich white guys with powers to save all of humanity Hmm. you know that's basically the central conceit behind like the avengers and uh like most most comic books especially superhero comics is that people are mostly weak and powerless and blubbering and that you really need a uh, an elite of a few super powered individuals to save them from themselves or to save them from some foreign threat. In this case, it's the, really the, uh, the citizens of Swayze block who are the heroes and who, uh, actually come to the, uh, defense and help judge dread and judge Beanie, who was also in the story, help them defend mega city one, a city, which has never really done anything for them from this mutant invasion. I mean that's that's an interesting thing to 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 consider the idea of uh survival and loyalty the you know that uh, a, a system that has brutalized you doesn't deserve your loyalty but people still maintain uh, uh kind of basic trust in systems e- even when that system is turning around and making their lives a a, a, a merry hell it it's I mean, again it it's a uh, a very interesting metaphor for a lot of what's going on uh, 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 at the moment. Um, I mean, do, do, you, do, you, do you see it as a kind of uh, calling into question systems that don't actually protect people? You know, when they're busy brutalizing them, they're, they're, they're actually not protecting them. Yeah, I, 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 this is kind of my biggest complaint about, um, you know, American civilization in particular, but civilization in general as well is that the institutions we have to serve us are usually about 30, 40 years out of date. And they're usually the last things to catch up to societal change. <clears throat> so, you know, like, same-sex marriage only becomes legal about, like, a generation after most people think it should be. Or, you know, most Americans are uh, in favor of some sensible gun control laws, you know, ID checks, and, you know, not selling assault rifles to just to, to people on the street uh but it'll probably be another 20 30 years before we see that enacted any sort of like institutional reform 
And so we're always kind of the victims of our the, the lateness of our institutions, the inability of our institutions to keep up with societal change. And when uh, a, a population gets so neglected by a civilization's institutions that it does that it not only fails to serve them, but in fact kind of victimizes them, that people drop out. They create their own institutions. You know, in a lot of ways, the, the reason why we created civilization was so that we could uh, e- exist on a large in large numbers and you know coexist in large numbers without killing each other. But if society is going to be killing you or um, exiling you anyway, then you uh, the the you have no reason to buy into these institutions. And when you don't buy into institutions, you have to create your own. And usually that means going back to some sort of like clan or family uh, structure. And that's kind of what happens in and Patrick Swayze block, not really being citizens of, of Mega City One, they become a family again. They become they create their own sort of tight familial bonds within the the, the building. In terms of uh, kind of character beats with with, with with something like Dread, as we've discussed. He can be something of a blank canvas. He can be, you know, a, 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 a catalyst uh, for a story, but not necessarily be a be a part of the story. For you, what are the kind of beats that you want to get with with uh, a character like Dread? Particularly when there's many people have very clear ideas of of what they want him to be as a character. Well, I think to me the, the thing I like best about Dread is he's someone you you utterly cannot BS. He sees through every sort of perp's excuse. He sees through every lie. He's somebody for who, for whatever his faults, could, could see right through you know the, the clutter and get to the heart of the matter. And that's what really kind of endears him to me. And I think that I try to bring that to uh, the Patrick Swayze block and that he sees the decay and sees the things going around there. And, and he, do, does, he doesn't buy that. I mean, he... Um, he he cuts through it to see that that this these people are in fact just sort of victims of their circumstances. It, it's interesting that uh, you know talking about the way that dread reacts to uh, the people within the block. It's kind of a theme that was explored uh, a little bit in um, the dread movie, the twenty twelve dread movie, where dread is. Uh, confronted by a lot of the consequences of shutting people up in big blocks and expecting them just to get on with their lives and and and, and behave themselves was that an influence have you seen the film yes and in fact it was an influence and in fact i i kind of see this comic as sort of a counterpoint to that hmm. again it was about dread and uh uh it was about dread sort of like making war on a block about having to him against all the the citizens of this of this uh, city block, and for me, I, that's again that sort of reinforces that that notion that uh, the purpose of power is to, is not to help people or empower them, but to keep them in line. And what I want to do is kind of tell a story where he has to make war on a block, but he has to do so on behalf of the people who live there, and that the people who live there are, are um, you know have their own lives and they have their own sort of ability to to think and act on their own behalf but they're not just sort of like either passive receptacles of his uh of his salvation nor are they these sort of barbaric just sort of uh uh animals that that are trying that he has to fight they're they're living breathing people that will in fact are needed to come to his defense mm. I mean, you make a good point about uh, the, the the nature of power there and the nature of authority. That um, so often uh, people confuse power with respect, and actually, without respect, you don't really have power. You just have force. Um, and again, that that, that 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 feels very much like a a, a a metaphor for the for the way that people are, are, are beginning to perceive uh, certain types of, of law enforcement. Because you, you, I mean, you've already referred to to, to, to people um, taking dread as a um, as a as a good thing, <laughs> you know, as as a, as a way forward. When you've got uh, police forces in the states putting Punisher decals onto their patrol cars and things like that. Yeah, not a good sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is this, uh, you know, a, a treatise on 
power and respect and and uh, like i said you know the 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 idea that uh, uh people need to buy into a system in order for it to be humane yeah there's a there's a phrase that keeps popping up in the background in the comic uh in latin uh solus populi a suprema es lex uh, which means the the good of the people is the whole of the law mm. uh, roughly translated and uh to me that's really sort of the theme of the piece is that the, the law and order isn't worth anything if it doesn't actually help people's lives if it doesn't if, if, if it's not actually helping the people it's supposed to serve live better lives then what good is it I mean, that, that, that's a very good point. It, it, it's one thing you often see when uh, people are discussing the nature of dread. They go, well, it, you know, he's he's brutal, but he's fair. You know, he, he only follows the law. We go, well, it, it's a pretty brutal law that he's following in the first place. You know, you, 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 if, you, right. if, if your defense is, well, you know, that's what's written down, then, uh, uh, you know, anything can be written down. It, it, and, yeah, right. you know. How many... How many legal systems, you know, in history that uh, are we now condemn people for fault? I mean, that's essentially what uh, that's essentially what Eichmann was convicted of is uh, being good at following the law. Mm. Mm. And uh, in terms of uh, the evolution of this of this project, is this very much the, the the story that you wanted to tell at the beginning, or has it evolved over the course of uh, of creating it? Yeah, it always, for me, it always evolves over the course of creating it. In fact, sometimes I don't even realize what I've written until it's done. And then I have to go back and change and to, to let it be what it needs to be as opposed to what I originally tried to cram it into being. Mm. <clears throat> but yeah, it really is, I think, most of the stories, at least the ones I feel like I've done well, end up being kind of human stories that, that that work on an emotional level as well as just sort of a basic plot or you know have something some intellectual point i want to say i think the ones i really that really mean a lot to me and the ones that i think are the most successful are ones that act one that actually get you to sort of emotionally connect to the characters mm. and i i think that um people will be surprised at um how much they relate to the what would normally be the background characters in in the story the, the people the citizens of swayze block and what they're going through is is there a particular reason why you've chosen uh, chose Patrick Swayze as uh, uh, as the name of your block? Not really. I mean, it was just kind of a <laughs> random thing. I just the first name I thought of because I know they name all you know, the blocks after famous people. It was just the first one that came to my yeah. But at the same time, I now looking back on it, I you know, in fact, I'd ri- written this scene that didn't make it into the final comic where um, one of the the citizens of Swayze Block is trying to inspire the other ones, and he invokes this this ancient he's i don't know too much about history but this block was named after an ancient warrior who you know brought justice to the roadhouse you know, <laughs> or, or something to that effect they and they go into battle yelling patrick swayze uh i eventually wrote that out it just seemed too corny uh but but yeah there that i think that was maybe what i was thinking subconsciously was that he's this sort of again sort of heroic aspirational figure that doesn't really exist <laughs> I want to come back to to, to uh, talking about franchise comics because you know you, you talk about these are the stories you want to tell, but you're you're telling them with characters that already exist. Is is it is it easier to throw up the contrasts to um, have people buy in than have to create a whole new world in which to tell the same kind of story? Is there a kind of shorthand you can skip across because people are already familiar with these characters? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of the big advantages of doing it is you borrow on the cultural equity of whatever property you're writing. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's, you know, you, you jump into a, a property that people already kind of know the backstory. They already kind of know things about the characters. So a lot of that sort of frame building is done for you. So then you can really just focus on telling the story you want to tell or, or maybe surprising them because they think they know more about the world than they do. And you are telling them something about you're shining a light on the part of the world that they hadn't seen before. So yeah, having people already invested in the, the characters and this, the, the cultural equity gives you a lot of possibilities in storytelling. Mm. Uh, definitely more than if you had to create something from scratch and uh, get them to buy into it from the, you know, completely cold. Mm. Well, I guess you can just, uh, uh, rather than having to, to walk people through it, you just go straight to the sprint uh, of, of the actual story. 
Exactly. Yeah, you drop them right. You can just drop them right in, and they, they know what's going on. Plus, you don't have to like sell them like, oh, this is something worth your while. This is something you really ought to read, mm. which which is always kind of a you know hard thing to do with new properties. Uh, you take an uh, an audience that already exists and show them something that surprises them, shocks them a little from what they're used to in that 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 franchise. Mm. In in an interview you, you did online, when you're talking about. Uh, uh comics as they are now uh what, what you're hoping to say to, to a comics audience um you say uh you want audiences to, to demand good writing uh, uh f- f- from their comics where, where, where do you think the state of comics writing is at the moment in the kind of mainstream uh, uh american industry well to be honest i think a lot of it is just sort of reminds me of professional wrestling you know it's, <laughs> it's like well who is the superhero not fought in a while yeah uh who have we not seen them team up with yet? And it's just a, you know, like a square dance of violence. It's just like, well, okay, we haven't had fun. And to me, that's like not really satisfying storytelling. It's not very imaginative. It's not really using the potential of the medium to talk about the world in which we live in and, you know, use it as like a, because to me, it's like the, it's, it's the, the greatest medium for subversion ever created because it's so democratic. It doesn't cost a lot to, you know, if you want to make a movie, you've got to convince some producer to sink like $20 million in your movie. And then you've got a lot of other people determining, you know, you got 13 other people going through the script. You've got an editor, uh, who chops your movie down into half its, its original length. And so the ability to like sort of talk directly to people doesn't really, isn't really as easy in film. Uh, as whereas in comics, you can kind of tell a visual story like a movie does, which is powerful and easily digestible and accessible to people. But you have complete control over what that person sees and reads, and and because it doesn't cost a lot to put out comics, and because it's not, uh, you know, high high risk for the publisher, you can tell a lot crazier or a lot more dangerous of a story than you could in, if you're making a big budget movie or, or something. So why to why people aren't taking advantage of that and actually telling stories that sort of are are shocking or a little. Um, little uh revolutionary that that don't you know that are that aren't sort of uh subversive i don't know it, but to me that seems like the natural purpose of the medium is to to give them those sort of like really thought out like treatises on the world that they can get through any sort of popular entertainment medium hmm. we've talked about how uh, this is the story that you want to tell with this character that you know you had to pitch it to idw is is that you done now have you told your dread story are you moving on to other things are there other stories in this world that you'd like to tell oh i would tell there's a lot of other stories in this world i'd like to tell in fact I, this is like one of like five different ideas i pitched to them i'd love to be able to do uh some of the other ideas at some point point. and uh have you seen any of the finished artwork I'm sorry. Have oh, you, you finished uh, artwork? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we're already the artwork's already halfway into uh, issue number two, and it looks great. Uh, mm-hmm. Max Dunbar is doing the artwork, uh, and it, it, yeah, it just looks fantastic. It is very sort of uh, there's the, the, it really captures like the sort of urban emptiness, sort of like it reminds me. In the, I don't want to sound too pretentious, although I've it's probably too late for that. Uh, <laughs> But it, it um, really reminds me of like um, the uh, uh, like like Nighthawks and the sort of like urban sort of loneliness uh, paintings of the the American Gothic in the nineteen forties and fifties, and, and it's it's really beautifully done, uh, filled with like dead bodies and mutants and <laughs> gunplay. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the art. Mm. I mean, that, that, that's, that's something that uh, uh, sometimes kind of gets forgotten is is just how much the physical environment of somewhere like Mega City One, uh, as you say, is a character of itself. But the the emptiness of this place, you know, the, the, these vast post urban landscapes, um, kind of. I mean, there's a metaphor there for your kind of Rust Belt, um, you know, your your Detroit's and and, and things like that. But uh, right. that in itself creates. Uh, a, a real loneliness for a system based on brutality. So the environment is brutal and the system that maintains it is brutal as well. Yeah, absolutely. It reinforces the narrative that, you know, all these institutions, all this civilization has built up something that doesn't really serve the people it was intended to help.
Well, many thanks to Mark for chatting about his Judge Dredd series. Issue one of that is out next week from IDW. You can go along to your local comic book store uh, and uh, order a copy, as well as getting it digitally from Comixology. We're going to be back in two weeks' time, Earthlets, with more from the universe of 2000 AD, beamed direct into your aural sensors. Until then, splendid birth <laughs> power levels dangerously high. Alert, alert, read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2000adonline.com. Alert! Alert! Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2000 AD on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2000 AD online. And follow on Instagram at insta2000 AD. Program complete. Shutting down.